Hi, my name is Chance Marshall. I work with the University of Wyoming Extension based here in Fremont County. And today I'm gonna to be talking to you about direct marketing beef in Wyoming. Now, 2020 has been a unique circumstance and, and there's uh, uh, some challenges that beef producers face today. And, and uh, but with every challenge, there seems to be opportunity. And, and on my first slide here, I, I show a couple charts, a couple graphs, and I'll explain them a little bit. But basically, uh, live cattle prices have been lower to normal. There's the, the graph there on the left-hand side is taken from uh, a recent market report, and there's three lines on that graph. Uh, the first line is a dotted black line, and that represents the five-year average for live five to 600 weight feeder steers. And then... Uh, you've got the blue line, that's uh, the average from a year ago throughout the year, and then the red line is our current line. So if you look at our current uh, prices throughout 2020, and you can see that it's uh, been, been lower to, uh, to, to normal, I would say, for most of the year um, as far as prices go for live cattle. But uh, if you look at the graph on the right, there's lots of blue bars and um, that's the price of retail beef between 1995 and 2019. And now you can see uh, lots of bars here. Um, 95 starts on the left and then going towards 2019, you can see that it's been a pretty steady increase in dollars per pound uh, for retail ground beef. And now some of that might be because of um, uh, inflation and other things, but I think it's pretty safe to say that, that uh, the price of beef has been steady to they're pretty good. So uh, with that, there is um, always some opportunity and um, I'll, I'll move on because I'm not an economist, but um, there are uh, some things that, that COVID-19 has done uh, that has made this situation unique. Uh, consumers seem to be uh, more concerned with their food shortage, maybe not so much in Wyoming, but if you look at the meat shelves in other places and, and some places in Wyoming, uh, as, as well as other shelves, um, there's just, uh, you know, there's, there's lots of bear shelves this year. And I think lots of people are, um, you know, concerned, stocking up. They're, they're filling their freezers, filling their pantries with food. And um, they're, they're more concerned about uh, just being able to feed their families and, and, and things like that. So um, that gives us an opportunity as beef producers to, to help them free, fill, the, fill those freezers without having to go through um, you know, uh, uh, our normal routes of doing that. Um, I seem to be, and maybe this isn't an effect of, of COVID-19, but they seem to be less trusting of the source, or, or maybe a better way of saying that is they want to know inform more information on where uh, their food comes from. Um, they, they, they're willing to pay more for that, it seems like, and it, it, it seems like if we can relay a good message, they, they, they like to know where it comes from and, and trust us more if we can do that. So um, they seem to be more supportive of small businesses versus import beef, um, things that come from other uh, outside of their, their town or their locality. They would rather see um, small businesses or, or help families that are, that are local. Um, they seem to be more supportive of that. And they're willing to pay a premium for local products. So these are all um, maybe some effects of COVID-19 and before um, that create this unique situation that we're in. Now, um, like I said, there's um, opportunity, with this opportunity, there's um, uh, ways that we can diversify our business strategies and, and maybe take a different look at the way that we normally do things and consider, um, you know, trying something a little different um, and take advantage of this opportunity uh, I tried to, throughout this presentation, include examples of Wyoming ranchers and Wyoming producers. Um, but in this case, these two pictures I found off the internet of a, uh, of a lady up in North Dakota that has been selling beef uh, out of pop-up stands. This picture down on the lower right, that's her selling uh, beef out of her freezers and just a little pop-up stand out of her horse trailer. Uh, she calls her business Ranchers Rebellion. And uh, she originally had the idea uh, before coronavirus hit that she was going to uh, make a little bit of money, extra money to help pay for her family being on the ranch. And, and, uh, and, and she was going to sell her products in grocery stores and, and um, 
gas stations throughout North Dakota. But then with coronavirus hitting and um, that just made it a little, little bit uh, tougher. So she decided to continue on with selling her product, but um, was going to sell it directly to producers and, and uh, through pop-up stands. And she's been pretty successful. And um, it's just kind of a cool story. You can read more about it on this link below. And I also included a link to some videos at the end of the presentation that um, you can you can check out that has a little bit more information on it. But uh, uh, the way that people are doing this for the most part is they're keeping the majority of their business uh, uh, just conventional. Um, generally, as cattle producers, as livestock producers, we sell live cattle. That's our main way of doing business. and uh, if we're selling beef, that's almost like a separate business. Um, so we're diversifying our strategy by adding a, a, you know, almost a separate business. So we sell live cattle and we sell beef and, um, the majority of it can still be done the way we normally do things, but we direct market some of the beef to offset costs. And in Wyoming this past year, it's been tough because not only for prices, but it's been a dry year. And um, lots of folks are having to buy hay, and um, uh, this is a way that maybe we can help pay for that. And it's kind of the way that um, my family and um, uh, we got involved in it as well, is that we just wanted to make up for some of the extra costs that we had for, um, from buying hay this year. Um, so we thought if we could sell some beef locally or throughout Wyoming, um, that it would offset that. And um, it seems to be uh, pretty successful. Uh, getting this out there and the idea is kind of catching on and it's not a new idea but it's something that uh, for the situation that we're in it's is worth considering but just to clarify direct to consumer marketing is any marketing that relies on direct communication or distribution to individual consumers rather than through a third party so this is the rancher uh, selling uh, meat directly to the consumers um, instead of selling it to uh, you know, going through uh, a packer um, and feedlot and, and everything like that. It's just, this is direct to consumers. And, and what's unique about Wyoming is we have the Food Freedom Act, which I'll talk about in a little bit, but uh, it allows us to do this form of marketing um, uh, pretty easily. And there's some benefits to this, this way uh, of doing business. Um, I mentioned that it's it's a good way to supplement profits and market locally, regionally for higher prices. Um, that's true, but it's also a really good opportunity for us to tell our story. That's something that we are always trying to do in agriculture, where um, you know a very small percentage of of our uh, American um, people are are our farmers and ranchers are tied to agriculture in any way, um, and it's really important, especially with uh, all these forms of information that people can get that, that we make sure that we do a good job of telling our story and, and telling our consumers where their product comes from, how our family businesses operate and, and how it gets from our place to their table. Um, so this is a good way of doing that, is this direct marketing or direct uh, marketing approach. Um, and with direct marketing, there's some requirements. Uh, you have to retain ownership of a small set of calves, obviously. I think it's a good idea to consider those that you retain uh, to be ones that have just something different about them. They don't fit in as uniform to the group. Maybe they're different size, color. Maybe they have horns that no, nah, doesn't really affect meat quality, but um, is is maybe won't make you the, the same you know same amount of money. They don't fit in with your uniform. Uh, group uh, that you're going to sell of, of their um, of, of other steers or heifers or whatever so it's a good idea maybe to consider those that are just a little different and you want to feed to finish yourself um, and there's lots of different approaches um, I'll talk I'll list out a few of them but um, this is the part that that you're going to want to tell the story of, of how you did it um, so yeah, and like I said, direct marketing, this isn't a new idea and it definitely includes challenges and some options that you have to consider. Um, and it may not be worth it for everybody or every operation to do, but uh, I think there is some real opportunity for a lot of op uh, operations and you don't really have to do um, anything uh, really that special. I think Wyoming producers produce some of the very best beef in the country and, um, and we just need to do a, our, our 
a good job of, of getting it out there and letting people know that it's available. There's some, uh, I'm going to go through the rest of the presentation and just talk a little bit more in depth about what your consideration should be when you're getting started with um, doing this. Uh, there's, I'll talk about each one of these in more in detail, but you know, first of all, you got to know your market. Um, you got to know who you're selling it to and, and what they're looking for. You got to know your associated costs. Um, like we talked about uh, earlier, um, there's going to be some cost to your time, your, your, uh, your money, your resources, your um, uh, all, there's there's lots of associated costs that you're going to have to factor in. Um, you got to know under know and understand the rules and regulations and protect yourself and protect those uh, your consumers. You got to have a good relationship with your packer and do your homework before you get started, um, for sure. Um, you got to know how you're going to package it, how you're going to label it. Um, you got to know uh, where it will be stored, if it'll be stored, and where it'll be stored. Um, that's a big one, um, and you got to know how much you uh, plan to, how much you need to sell it for to break even, and, and what you'd like to make off of uh, what what would what would it take to make it worth your time. So these are some questions. Um, but first of all, I'll start out with just talking a little more in depth about your target market. Um, and there's lots of different angles that you can take in this to, to help tell your story and, and how your beef is produced and what makes your product unique. Um, so you got to know your market and find your niche. Um, you got to know who you're trying to appeal to. Um, and like I said, it doesn't have to be anything um, uh, super specific. Wyoming, uh, locally grown uh, Wyoming beef is, um, you know, like I said, we produce some of the best beef in the country. Um, we've got some of the best producers that that do a great job and, and uh, I think there is a, uh, a, a level of quality that comes along with that. So that might be one way that you go. Um, there's lots of folks that are doing that right now. Um, you could be a BQA or humanely uh, handled, uh, low stress handling. Um, you could, if that's um, something that you really uh, find important in your operation, that's something that you could, you could uh, market with. Um, exceptional quality. Uh, you could set a standard on uh, yeah, what what uh, quality grade uh, stuff that you're going to be marketing, or or if you're using something like um, you know Wagyu beef or or something like that that marbles exceptionally, or or just is going to be a consistent um, you know tender good taste. They know if they buy this from you that it's going to be uh, good quality. Um, there's lots of folks that are doing that as well, uh, and there's definitely uh, a, folks that are willing to pay a premium for that. Now on the other side, there's also people that uh, prefer their, their beef to be a little leaner. Um, they, they don't want the fat, they don't, uh, um, you know, they'll, they'll pay for something a little different or grass-fed. Um, grass-fed seems to be a, a really popular one now and it's obviously gonna be uh, different, uh, different in taste, different in appearance than um, what, most people are used to in the stores and and uh, I think we need to do a good job of of informing our consumers what they're going to buy and and uh, with grass fed there's obviously um, uh, you know an increased time uh, that you have to feed those animals to get them finished um, so yeah they've got to know what what uh, what to expect with that and you've got to know as a producer what to expect um, you can do the all natural hormone free route um, there's people that uh, that, that you know go with that and you know don't implant and, and can sell them that way or there's also uh, ways that we can um, maybe target the ethnic market something that's a little different uh, you got to think too um, maybe some cultures value uh, organs and things like that that we don't normally um, market but um, perhaps there's a way that we could get those out um, and and make some money off of those as well so um, there's lots of ways and, and really you don't have to um, do what everybody else is doing. You can, you know, figure out your own way of doing it. Um, I think there's some people that are, well, I know there's people that are marketing uh, grass-fed, grain-finished beef, because that's typically um, the way that, uh, the way, the way that it is. And, um, you know, there's a period of, of finishing that we go through that, uh, that you have to figure out for yourself that whether it's 60 days or 90 days or over 100 days um, and what uh, weight we expect them to get to. But 
um, you know, you can be creative with uh, how you're going to market it and, and what your niche is, but whatever it is, establish your brand and, and stick to it. Um, and like I mentioned, there's going to be some increased costs retaining animals. Um, if we're going to go the grass fed route, like I said, it, it's going to take about three times longer or more uh, to uh, get these animals to finish weights. Um, so it could be increased cost of your pasture, your time, your resources. If you're feeding out, uh, ex you know, exceptional quality or um, different genetics like, you know, the Japanese genetics Wagyu beef, um, they're also going to take a lot longer to finish than our um, than a lot of our normal breeds. So there's going to be increased costs there. Um, and you gotta, you gotta determine if the extra value that you're going to get is worth the extra costs. Um, for some folks it is, if you get a lot of grass pasture, that might make sense. The, the picture in the lower right is a low, uh, a local operation here in Fremont County that, uh, has done a good job of marketing grass fed hormone free beef to, um, folks at farmers markets. Um, throughout Wyoming and and they've uh, yeah they've got a good resource there and um, can afford to to you know feed them out a little longer and um, I've also uh, got a colleague that I work with that fed out five Wagyu steers and we're selling out quarters um, and uh, he was able to 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 keep those at his house and feed them and and it wasn't uh, you know it wasn't an issue as far as uh, you know keeping them a little extra and, and feeding them to finish um, as opposed to a normal, normal steer time wise. Um, like, uh, you gotta know your rules and regulations. Um, Wyoming is unique, uh, in the fact that we have the food freedom act, which allows for direct sales within Wyoming. And, uh, uh but there is some uh, limitations to that. There's, there's no third party sales, so we can sell directly to the consumers. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they can get into the restaurant chain and, uh, or grocery stores, uh, a lot of that is going to require a USDA inspection, which Wyoming has a shortage of. Um, but there is a lot of efforts to get uh, USDA inspected facilities that would allow for us to get it into grocery stores or uh, potentially restaurants and, and really help us um, establish uh, Wyoming, uh, Wyoming beef and, and allow us to move our products across state lines and um, that's a big obstacle that um, Wyoming producers are trying to get through right now. And we've got various efforts throughout the state uh, to get USDA inspection and, and get a, a good amount of Wyoming beef uh, going through there and, and staying in the state and going outside the state with a Wyoming stamp on it. And I think that's important, but you got to know uh, if the packer that you're dealing with is state inspected or USDA inspected and what your limitations are with that. Um, also, just packer availability is is one of the biggest considerations I think that um, people have to think about when they're getting into this is uh, will will I have a spot? There's there's a shortage of uh, you know packers that are close by that can do this, and and there's a big demand for their services. So uh, they recommend that you start shopping uh, or start planning about a year in advance, really, to secure your spot and stay up on that. And, making sure that um, they keep your name down and, and keep a plan uh, in place uh, because availability is a is an issue that you got to consider also you got to have a plan uh, with your packer as far as uh, the number of head that you will commit um, are you going to do five head are you going to do ten head um, are you going to do them all at once uh, or are you going to stagger them well, there's some producers um, that are gonna can that are gonna commit about 20 head but only slaughter five of them quarterly so that throughout the year their producers have beef um, uh, available to them uh, but obviously there's some challenges that go with that and management um, your age of your cattle and, and everything that goes along with that so maybe that's not an option but it's something that you should consider when you're gonna do it and and if you do a bunch at once, what are you going to do? Uh, are you going to have a place for all of that to go right away? Or are you going to have to store it? Um, so there's some consideration for packers. Also packaging. How are you going to uh, package it and sell it, market it? Are you going to sell, you know, the, the most common way is to sell a whole beef or half a beef or a quarter of a beef. Um, but that's not necessarily the only way that you 
can do it, you can also offer boxes of beef. There is some producers that will sell a miscellaneous box or a family package or something like that that has a little bit of a mixture of everything, but uh, isn't isn't so much that um, it's going to occupy a ton of space in the freezer. Um, there's some folks that are going to market their steaks separate from their ground meat. Uh, it doesn't seem to be a problem usually to get rid of our steaks. Our steaks uh, are higher priced um, parts of the animal. Um, those are pretty easy to sell and, and good quality and we can market those. But you got to remember that the majority of the meat that we've got to deal with is ground meat and uh, finding a home for that is important. And uh, so, yeah. And also if you're going to have multiple uh, beef butchered at once, um, you might be able to have some cost savings if you batch it, which means, um, you you know, you put, you, you don't necessarily keep one beef all together in a quarter or a half, but you, you batch it so there's a rib over here and, and a roast over here um, from a different animal, but they're all, all the, you know, parts are put into piles and then batched back together to make a quarter or half. Um, that can be some cost savings, um, just something to think about. Um, and how you're going to package it and sell it. Um, having a logo uh, and the way you label it, uh, make your product recognizable is important and can really make a difference. Uh, and there is some uh, there there is some uh, restrictions on on how you do this and, and where it's processed and stuff like that. But if you if at all possible, um, you can get a logo and print it on there so that people um, start to uh, it, it just helps people recognize what it is and and when they uh, come back for it they'll remember the logo when um, a lot of people that are doing this now are investing uh, you know some resources into and having a recognizable label um, that uh, when people know that they see like this is an example of some friends of ours that are operating southwest wyoming on the lone tree ranch and they they um uh promote their their brand of beef and and um, just with their logo people understand uh, what makes their product uh, uh, unique and it maybe maybe it will specify weight or maybe it won't specify how much weights in the package it depends on where you're getting it processed but um, but yeah it's a good idea to have something like that um, also know how you're gonna price it it's like any business venture, it's a good idea to know what your break-even value is. What is it that you need to make um, to uh, to cover all your costs and and things like that? Uh, so knowing knowing what your break-even is to sell or to to feed and finish a 1,250-pound steer, and then what you need to sell it for. I was talking to Kelsey Christensen, who um, uh, he's he's got the 307 Meat Company down there in Laramie. It's a USDA inspected facility and and uh he's dealing with lots of um wyoming folks that are trying to market meat and and i asked him if he had any advice for folks that are um going to uh consider doing this and he one of the biggest things that he said and i just left it in quotes is to sell meat not cattle um that uh this is just a different way of thinking for a lot of people that um are getting into this and uh um, we're used to, like I said earlier in the presentation, we're used to selling cattle as uh, ranchers, um, but we need to be selling meat and, and be clear with our consumers uh, what they're going to get. Um, we tend to think of live animals and being 1,250 pounds, that's what we're selling. And we need to make sure that our consumers understand that what they're, how many pounds of meat they're going to get and what it's going to look like in the packages. Because the majority of our consumers don't really understand what uh, dressing percentage is and that you know if we get 62 percent dressing percentage off of a 1250 pound steer um and then uh then we take the we trim the fat off and take the bones out and um package the meat um and then divide that by four you know we might be only looking at 100 or 120 pounds of of, uh, of meat and a quarter um of a beef so we need to make sure that they're clear on what they're going to get, and uh, that they they um, feel feel good about it when they do get it. Also, um, you need to make sure your your price matches what your consumer is willing to pay for the value added product. Uh, uh, you got to make sure that I've said it a few times, but make sure that what you're pouring into it is worth uh, what you're going to get out of it, 
and you want to look for repeat buyers. This is uh, you don't want to necessarily have somebody that comes in and buys it once and then never buys again. Uh, you want to make an impact on them uh, so that they come back uh, and, and will seek out your product. And this is going to require some more frequent uh, attention and effort and communication, um, which you've got to be willing to do. Um, may, you know, maybe that's just checking in on them uh, or, or helping them uh, with how to prepare it or, or, or things like that, or, you know, making sure that they are satisfied with the product or um, answering any questions they might have. This is, this is uh, how we get repeat buyers. Also, with your pricing, you want to uh, standardize. Uh, I, Kelsey also suggested that um, it'd be a good idea to standardize a cut uh, if you can um, and, and sell it that way. Uh, but some folks like to let the customer choose how they get it cut. You know, maybe that's fat thickness or how it's trimmed or, or whatever. But if you get each beef cut differently, that's, that's going to be a, um, a cost difference back or more than likely. Um, so if you do have a standard cutter, you go with, um, you know, a certain way of doing it and then sell it, um, that might be an easier way to go. But uh, it's something that uh, if you're going to allow them to do, um, it might either cost you or cost them a little bit more. And then another consideration that uh, you might have folks that don't live real close to you um, but want to buy your product, would you be willing to deliver that? Or are they going to be in charge of picking it up or or what is the um what is the agreement going to be uh for them to to get the product um just something to consider and and um uh you know have a plan before you uh get going i asked um kelsey with 307 meets kind of what uh price range are we looking at for uh direct cons to consumer uh pricing and obviously the he wasn't able to give me a, a real great answer because it's different for everybody and it's different for um, all different uh, ways of, of doing things. Um, and, and maybe your uh, break even price is different than mine, but he was saying that in general, that Wyoming raised beef pricing, just that Wyoming raised brand uh, is, is selling for about $3,200 for a full beef that's cut and wrapped and everything. Uh, uh, $1,675 for a half and $875 for a quarter, which breaks down to about $6 per pound overall. Um, yeah, and this was actually surprising to me. Um, we just, my family and I just got started in, in marketing our own beef this year a little bit. And, and uh, uh, we were a little below these prices, but uh, I, they're, yeah. Um, that's that's kind of how it broke down and I was talking to Kelsey um, but obviously that can be different for everybody like I was saying and and especially if you price cuts separately um, you you know your your stakes are probably going to be more than six dollars a pound and your grounds going to be less so um, that six dollars a pound is just an average of, of everything um, the one of the last things I want to talk about is just a marketing plan and having a good marketing plan in place um, you got to ask yourself and, and have a plan on where you're going to sell your product. Um, some folks want to sell, where are they going to get in front of these uh, consumers? Some people um, target farmers markets. Um, others have their own pop-up stands like the example I was talking about in North Dakota earlier. Um, a lot of people are using social media uh, to get the word out. Um, but social media can be tricky in that um, uh, if you're trying to sell something, there's certain restrictions that Facebook will allow you to do and others that uh, they won't and, and sell of animal parts or guns or things like that. Um, sometimes they have restrictions on that um, and, and won't allow you to, to do that. Um, and then also having paid ads uh, really will help your um, you know, number of people that will see it and you can target those ads to be a certain demographic. Um, but really uh, you got to be careful on how you make those ads like i was saying um, they really don't like uh, uh, ads for selling animal parts but it's a good uh, opportunity for uh, social media is a good opportunity for us to tell our story tell what product we are selling or what's available and how they can get it um, and those 
that information you can get out there. Um, but just understand um, kind of how the social media world works and that if you post it to your personal uh, profile, is that going to be enough to um, get all of uh, the eyes that need to see it uh, to see it? Or if there's um, ways either through paid ads or, um, you know, other ways to get that, that information out on social media. Also, just word of mouth. Um, usually once, uh, you know, in a smaller community like most of Wyoming, when, when uh, somebody knows that beef is available, they might tell their friends and, and that obviously helps to get uh, the information out there. But, or any other um, ways that you can think of to, to sell your product that needs to go into your marketing plan and, and um, what, uh, how, you, how you plan to get it out there. Um, like I was saying, uh, it's a good idea to, to use this to, or you, inside your marketing plan to tell your product story. And uh, the picture below is just my father-in-law feeding his heifers. Um, and uh, I don't know, just just things like that that, that you can tell uh, that you personally did it, and and or that your family did it, or or it happened on your place, or however you can tell that story and um, give them information is important. And also, I think it's a good touch to include recipes or suggestions on how to best showcase your meat lead product. Um, maybe not everybody that. Uh, uh, is going to buy your product it has has you know cooked it or dealt with it a lot and you want to make sure that they have a good experience with it um, so including um, you know suggestions or recipes of ways you like to eat it or um, or uh, you know suggestions can go a long way so I think um, including that or um, some kind of personal touch is a good idea um, you know, make sure your target audience is going to see it. And and if you don't have a good marketing plan, uh, plan to have lots of extra beef in your freezer. Um, because uh, if you don't do a good job marketing it, um, more than likely you're going to eat it yourself. And um, so, uh, yeah, there's just some things to consider. Uh, like I said, I, I have uh, a few links here to different videos. I did an interview with RFD TV. Uh, it's the top one that's just talking about. Um, uh, ways to uh, direct market your products and then also uh, the grass-fed operation that's here in Fremont County is the Lost Wells Cattle Company and then you can read about that Ranchers Rebellion North Dakota story um, and how uh, COVID affected that and sparked um, their business so um, that's about all I have uh, thanks a lot for listening uh, feel free to contact me if you have any um, ideas questions or suggestions um, this is my contact below and um, uh, wish you all good luck and uh, thanks again uh, and we'll see you later